General Mazrui, I think uh, we could all agree that one of the problems in the Gulf is that the Iranians and the Arabs of the Gulf have far too little interaction with one another. But that being said, I have to say that uh, I find it a bit problematic that you think that President Rouhani in these few months should have been able to change all these things to prove himself, otherwise there is nothing to be had. And B, more importantly, that he can change things in Iran or Iran's stance to the outside world all, of his, all on his own. If you want change in Iran, you are going to have to change as well. You cannot expect them to just change everything while you can stand still. So if you will, it's a question of trying to find not a mutually assured destruction, but a mutually assured aid between those who want the taunt and reform. And it can't be a one-side street. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador LaRocco. Thank you. I have a two-part question. The first part for Lieutenant General Ferris, the second part for Lieutenant Colonel Steve. Um, in my discussions with a number of Gulf leaders, they have told me that they would rather see Iran make the decision to acquire a nuclear weapon than see the United States reach a broad agreement with Iran. And I would like your comment on that. Now, my point to Steve is, while we all recognize that Rouhani may be empowered to do no more than happy talk. Assuming that he is serious about negotiations, how far, how broad an agreement would the United States, in your view, be willing to go, recognizing that the broader the agreement, the less comfortable our Gulf friends would be, while the broader the agreement, the more comfortable our Israeli friends would be? Uh, thank you. Toby Dodge. Uh, thank you. Uh, three uh, wonderful presentations. Uh, just off the back of Steve's incredibly pessimistic, but I think very accurate presentation, I wanted to ask General Farris, I, I salute all the hard work you've uh, invested into getting, trying to get rid of the Assad regime, but I'd be a lot more uh, uh, happy if I could see similar investment, extended investment in forward thinking about what happens the day after. Uh, what, happen, you know, what type of state, state society relations, structures, interaction, beyond, as someone was saying behind me, the happy talk about a united opposition. And I think, uh, to General Mayo, if you're right, and I think the, the comparison between Iraq in 1991 and Syria in 2011 is a particularly powerful one, but that means, of course, that the Assad regime wins simply by not losing. And the longer it consolidates its grip along these divided frontiers, as Steve is pulling out, the more it does look like 91 to 2003. And then finally, I would have thought there was a lot of um, dramatic talk about the end of Sykes-Picot. Why I wouldn't be so dramatic is that the vast majority of the populations within those borders support those borders and support, have grown to support the states that, 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 that now keep Sykes-Picot relevant to their everyday lives. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. Um... Nazanin, please. Um, thank you. Uh, I think one of the main differences between Iran, Syria, and Egypt is their, their history, in the sense that, number one, Iran's quest for democracy or pluralism began in 19, 1904, way before even Russia uh, started uh, entertaining the idea. Certainly in 1978, we had uh, uh, the Islamic Revolution, and it has taken us 35 years to understand uh, the contradictions and the dangers of having a theocracy and rule by divine right. Um, and if you look at the elections this year, the candidate, there was an inverse correlation between the positions of the candidates uh, the further they were from the position of the supreme leader, the more vote they got. That is why you got Mr. Rouhani in. And that is why the Revolutionary Guards, the candidates for the Revolutionary Guards, lost. And at the end of the day, I think, when you talk about the nuclear program, is they running, are they running people behind the nuclear program? That remains a big question. Since 2005, there has been an absolute censorship by various governments on newspapers and media. They cannot talk about 
the dangers of the nucle nuclear program, the environmental implications, the safety implications, and more than that, the financial implications of the nuclear program in Iran. So when we talk about Iran, Syria, and Egypt, let's keep the people out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there body? The problem with this panel is that no one talked about the economy stupid. There is one common thread that goes through Egypt, Syria, and Iran, and that is high unemployment, poverty, weak economies. And the problems both in Egypt and in Syria had a major economic components, and I think this is a subject that should be addressed. Um, thank you. Abtisam al Kadbi. Nobody talk about the, the, reg the Arabic regional system. All this uh, weakness of Syria and Egypt, how affected the system bringing external uh, actors from outside the region, Iran and Turkey, who is dominating uh, this region, uh, especially in uh, Syria and uh, Egypt. I think this is needs more uh, focus on it. The other thing, it seems to me like what I'm uh, watching Syria, that Assad regime become partner with the West in, in terms of fighting the terrorist. Is it right or not? This is how it's uh, uh, looking like, especially with the deal of uh, uh, chemical uh, weapon. I think there are four scenarios for, for Syria, either falling of the regime, which it, I don't think it, it, uh, it will be, uh, or winning of the regime, it could be, it's difficult, yes, or we will uh, go for the big deal which is now going on between the West and Russia and uh, Iran, most likely. The fourth thing, the civil war, which can last for a long time. And Lebanon is there, the experience of Lebanon, 16 years. Uh, Lebanon had civil war, which can, uh, this is most likely uh, happen. Nobody talk the future uh, of Egypt, the future of Muslim Brotherhood in, uh, in Egypt, and how this, uh, it will, um, have impact on the on the Arabic system as a whole. That Egypt, absence of Egypt as a, a, a power in the region, and a, a rising of those small states like Qatar. Uh, Saudi is not uh, a small, but it wasn't uh, before Egypt, uh, UAE. So talking about the small uh, actors in the uh, region. The last thing, the concept of democracy. I mean, how can you apply democracy without Democrat? When you have those people still ha has no tolerance towards the other who is different than them. It's still a long process, not because we are different than the West, but the norms in the Arabic system still needs to build on the, democr the democratic culture, which is not there. That's why it didn't work. Election doesn't mean democracy. Election can yield non-democrat. This is what happened when it brought uh, Muslim uh, brotherhood to the uh, rulership. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Watanabe in the back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there is a free, frequent remarks that, uh, which says uh, uh, which said a reference of Tunisia was a mistake in watching uh, a Syrian situation, uh, as, uh, as a panel said. Uh, but uh, I, in this regard, I was impressed by the uh, uh, explanation of American reporter, which said that the, uh, 
at the time of the starting point of this situation, uh, regardless of religion and regardless of ethnic, many people stood up against the uh, regime. So uh, could I say the reference of Tunisia was not a mistake. And what people made a mistake was to miss the uh, usual political phenomenon to, uh, of changing uh, political cleavage as a basement of polit uh, political powers framework. I think so it could be successful the uh, Assad regime, a uh, statement due to balanced power, it, it, it will be much better than the uh, government faced overwhelming, uh, overwhelming people's power, like the case of uh, Romanian revolution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go back to the panel for the first uh, round of, of answers. Uh, General, please. Uh, sorry, so, some, some, because I cannot hear here, so I, can, I need to reply uh, to repeat to me some of the questions. Uh, I can get to the first one from uh, the back, which is uh, about the changes. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the nation, uh, there are meas measures for changes which you, you try to measure the nation changes, country changes, such as economy, uh, unemployment, uh, so uh, poverties. In, uh, in the Arab world, uh, on the Gulf region, I think all those are on the positive lines. So we are not worried about the changes among uh, what, what we are worried about, that the neighboring country uh, figures are not promising. And this will have an impact on us, uh, whether uh, soon or later. So this is really what, what change is supposed to be. Another question I have uh, from Frontier about uh, after Assad's. Uh, uh, the day after. Uh, I'm working also among, uh, among a Friend of Syria group, which is, uh, consists of 11 countries, the core group. Uh, we have a number of uh, uh, committees which is looking after uh, this, this issue, uh, such as uh, shortly uh, or lately we uh, we've announced in Berlin with the, our colleague, uh, Germans group is... Uh, uh, launching a trust fund. Uh, we have uh, worked out the trust fund uh, since uh, we formed a committee uh, after uh, Marrakesh meetings, uh, December 2012. Uh, we come out with a number of solutions. Uh, so one of them was the trust fund. Uh, this is to create a vehicle for uh, Syria uh, for the Syrian leaders in the future. Uh, at the same time, a uh, trusted vehicle for the donor's country to donate. Uh, we are not there in a, in a political, to be honest with you, because the situation is not helping, and securities. But economically, we are ahead. Uh, I, I fully agree uh, with Aberdeen about uh, uh, the common enemy of the region. As I said, we measure the regions by the economy, the poverties, and uh, the uh, unemployment. Oh, uh, the unemployment was uh, underestimated by most of the country's uh, leaders or governments. Uh, uh, before the, uh, the Arab Springs, uh, Yemen was uh, uh, around 60% of its youth is unemployed. Egypt the same, uh, Tunisia is the same. So those are, those are the indicators who are touching the red and nobody was looking. Uh, uh, they are still there, yes, they are still there. Uh, they are not improved, yes, they are not improved. So are they worrying you? Yes, they're really worrying us. We need to put more efforts on, 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 on those aspects to improve the life of the people. Uh, 
The external, I think, uh, Ibtissam uh, al Qutbi mentioned that the external players on the Arab world. This is normal. The, everybody has an interest in the Arab world, and this is we cannot hide it. And, and that is normal. There are there are interests for Iran. There are interests for Turkey. There are interests for United States. So, <clears throat> how we live within those interests, and how we survive, and how we create a common. Uh, interest uh, where we really uh, uh, th this is this is fact i mean we cannot hide our uh, our he eyes and hide heads and and, and and live without them uh, 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 a pop up of a players on the arab world this is normal because uh, we've we, as you know egypt was uh, almost uh, paralyzed syria uh, uh, Algeria, you know those countries. Uh, Iraq uh, used to be uh, leadings on on the 50s and 60s, and uh, because of that, so we there is there is a vacuum on the leaderships, and 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 and, uh, and Qatar has, uh, has uh, the right to lead if there is no leaders. I mean, this is this is a normal in the in the, in the human life, but. Uh, is this uh, um, role uh, was uh, coordinated? This is the very important questions. Is it Qatar alone or it's a coordinated uh, role? It was a coordinated role by the Arab League. Uh, I think uh, most of the decision which is being taken in the Arab League was the right decision. It was, was a coordinated decision and not, not, not Qatar alone or even Saudis alone. Even in the GCC uh, area, uh, we have also uh, good coordinations, uh, such as Yemen case, Yemen file. We played it very right, and we played it very well. And I think this is the most successful uh, uh, solution, uh, which is uh, the Arabs by themselves find the, the solution for their, one of their problems. I don't know if I miss uh, some no. of the points. No, you want to make Yeah. لا أنا قلت لي في البداية عن ال. جنوب مايا. Is that live? Oh, thanks very much. Yes, I'm just running briefly down them. I take the first point about if we want to change in Iran, we need to change the attitude to them. Um, that being critical of my American friends, I do think sort of unqualified opposition to Iran since 1979 has not served as a really good pillar uh, of a Middle Eastern policy. Uh, in terms of the Iran gets the weapons rather than a U.S. deal, I totally get that. I think the, the, the threat from Iran is much broader than the nuclear file, although that clearly is the one that concerns us most. Uh, ideas of Persian hegemony, ideas of championship of Shia minorities, or in the case of uh, Bahrain majorities, are, are very worrying to the Gulf monarchy. So I think it depends on, on what that deal is. Um, and it's worth remembering that in the 70s, when the British foolishly pulled out of the Gulf, uh, we talked about the Shah being the policeman of the Gulf, and I don't think that sent a very warm, comforting message around our Gulf, Gulf friends at all. I do notice, however, that we have swapped, ceased talking about the Persian Gulf and very firmly now talk about the Arabian Gulf. Um, I think the day after work is, is, is interesting. I remember the Qatari is saying that they fully expected to pay a vast amount of money after Assad had gone. But that was in 2012. Uh, I think the scale of the day after problem in uh, in Syria in 2013-14 will be will be quite ex quite extraordinary. Um, but um, it's difficult to know where I instinctively want to fall down on Stephen's side that we might be in a position where we've broken it up. Uh, we've created new circumstances for political dialogue that might lead to a ceasefire, etc. But my instinct is to fall back on the oldism again. Uh, and fall into Emile's camp that this is uh, uh, still gloomy. Um, I, I do think Toby's line um, in terms of looking at 91 for Assad, um, I think Saddam would still be there if, frankly, up to a point we'd have had an Arab Spring somewhere. Um, I think uh, Saddam would have been able to face it down, a bit like Assad is. Uh, I think the reality is, um, given the ethnic uh, composition of the regime and the security forces, yeah, if they lose, as Saddam loses, you go into a permanent subordination, uh, which has happened to the Sunni Arabs in Iraq and would happen uh, to the Alois in, um, in uh, 
Iraq if they, if they lose. It's quite, quite existential. This is historical for them. Sykes-Picot agreement is, is interesting. If you look at where the, where the real problems are, and you look at Iran, you get Turkey, you get Egypt, and then you get the Gulf monarchies. They're all pretty solid, frankly. Iran's borders have hardly changed in, in centuries. Uh, Turkey views itself, you know, it's the core of the old Ottoman Empire. Egypt, terrific, great civilization in its own right. Gulf monarchies, both by, by, by geography and money, are well founded and, of course, protected by um, a coalition of other people interested in that. And so you get in the center Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, uh, you know, and, um, and Iraq, Baghdad, Damascus, great, the, you know, the great capitals of the Abbasid and Umayyad dynasties. Uh, but they're the ones that have always been played over between Ottomans, Safavids, uh, Fatimids, etc. So unsurprisingly, those historical uh, uh, ten tensions still playing out. Um, I think, interesting, the, the lady talking about whether the Iranian people are behind the nuclear program. Um, I'd love to test it. I wish we could. Um, all the indications seem to give us an idea that it's, it's something the Iranians do, do gather around, that it is part of their sense of historical sense of their identity as a, as a great nation. Uh, we know that this is not about Iran getting the bomb. This is about Iran, then Syria, uh, sorry, then Saudi Arabia, then Egypt, then Turkey getting a bomb. In terms of poverty and weak economies, I, th I think there are no agreed solutions. It's interesting when Turkey flexes its muscles economically and commercially, it's highly successful. When it flexes them politically, it gets real pushback. And I think that's where we must engage with the regimes, particularly in Egypt because it's absolutely vital that we have a stable Egypt for every, from every perspective, not least for the, uh, the, uh, the people of Egypt themselves. Um, but we do need, we've got to be careful about what we can achieve, but I still think we want to push for inclusiveness. But part of that is trying to find a government that realizes, going back to what General Farris said, uh, that we need to address some of the underlying root causes that, as I said, I don't think we put enough credence to when we thought this was all about freedom and democracy and uh, uh, you know, guardian readership. Um, and uh, again, the lady quite rightly there said, um, you know, democracy does, does prove. We, any of us who looked at Egypt knew that if you had democracy, a socially conservative society was probably going to put the Muslim Brotherhood in the first turn of the wheel. The tragedy is they failed a lot quicker than we were hoping. We hoped they might see out about four years, have demonstrably have failed, and enough people then democratically would have kicked them out, come in with a much more progressive uh, government. Uh, and the problem, again, I think taking up what the, the gentleman at the back, the, the problem in all elements of the Arab Spring is we all knew what people were against. But by goodness, it was a broad coalition that never really coalesced around what they were for. Thank you. Thank you. Steve? Most of the, que most of the questions have been dealt with, I think, quite brilliantly by Generals Ferris and, and uh, Mayall. Uh, I'll take the one that was addressed specifically uh, to me, among one or two others. Uh, uh, Jim LaRocco's question about a deal. Um, uh, just as a general principle, both sides for a long time have sought a broader agenda. Um, but for different reasons, or at least that's been the perception on our side. Uh, we've wanted um, a broader agenda to build confidence that could pave the way towards serious negotiations over uh, Iran's nuclear program, but uh, the U.S. has perceived Iran's desire for a broader agenda as a way simply to deflect attention. Um, uh, from the issue that's at the core of uh, American interest, namely the nuclear program, um, uh, some uh, recently have pointed to Syria as um, a focal point for ad hoc U.S.-Iranian uh, cooperation diplomatically in a way that could build confidence uh, for other purposes. And the precedent um, uh, people point to is, of course, U.S.-Iranian cooperation over Afghanistan uh, in the early 90s, um, which was curtailed by the United States for uh, reasons having to do with uh, uh, perceived Iranian support uh, for a terrorist attack against Saudi Arabia at the uh, Oasis compound, if you remember. In any case, uh, that fell through. Uh, the UN uh, recently dispatched its top um, uh, diplomat, uh, that is the Secretary General dispatched its top diplomat to Tehran. Um, uh, this would not have been done uh, without the knowledge of the United States um, and possibly even the coordination. Uh, I don't know what uh, emerged from that. I doubt uh, anything very much did emerge. My sense is that um, uh, Iran is very committed uh, to its current program in 
uh, in Syria. I think it's a core interest uh, for Iran, and even though there's um, a good deal of dyspepsia uh, in the Mejlis about the cost of the involvement, I think it's perceived to be essential by the RGC, uh, the, you know, the, Revo the Revolutionary Guard Corps, um, that has uh, a rather substantial influence in, his, in Iranian policymaking on that side um, uh, of, of the fence. I think if the discussion were to be broadened, it would have to be accompanied by the same sort of uh, intense uh, or intensive, rather, uh, hand-holding that the U.S. has done uh, until now, over the, certainly over the past four years and probably much um, uh, before that, both uh, you know, in the Gulf on the one hand and among Israelis on the other. Um, the administration probably spends much more time doing that hand-holding than it does planning for you know, negotiations with Iran. Um, uh, we have um, understandably uh, concerned and, and needy partners in the region uh, who think, um, uh, I think possibly with some justification that, that their security might be, you know, at risk if there were to be some sort of condominium in sort of nightmarish terms um, between the U.S. and Iran over the region. I don't see any of that happening, and I don't see that as being a U.S. objective. Um, very far from it, uh, uh, rather, but nevertheless, the hand-holding is necessary and it will, uh, it will persist. Um, thank you, gentlemen. Um, one of our uh, main uh, um, job responsibilities at the ISS is to stay on time, uh, and uh, we met at uh, the time. Um, I apologize to those on my list who wanted to ask a question. It's really to keep the trains uh, running. Uh, that we, we do this. Uh, thanks a lot, gentlemen, for very provocative remarks, and please join me in thanking them.